Hello, I'm George Mason, host of Good God, Conversations That Matter About Faith and Public Life. My guest today is Ron Kirk, former mayor of Dallas, and he'll be talking about his own faith journey and his sense of how faith contributes to the common good. Welcome to Good God, Conversations That Matter About Faith and Public Life. I'm George Mason, and I'm joined today by Ron Kirk. Ron uh, is the former mayor of Dallas, former U.S. Trade Representative under Barack Obama's administration. Uh, he's a lawyer and uh, a good friend, as a matter of fact, as well. And Ron, welcome back. We're glad to have you here on it's Good It's good Talk. to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. So in our last conversation, Ron, we got to talking about the church you grew up in, which the Kirk family actually built uh, down in the Austin area. And uh, so I, I think it would be interesting for people to know, what did you take from that experience growing up in church? What's stayed with you? Well, you time? know, I'm, and then we start just to frame it, if maybe people didn't see the first thing. I'm mm -hmm. born in 1954, so right. I'll be 64 years old uh -huh. soon. But so I'm, you know, young enough, old enough to have been both a child of Jim Crow and segregation, but also the first generation beneficiary of the civil rights movement. And so my family, like a lot of families, um, was one of those that the only place where one, you could just get a little dignity was the church. Right. And the one institution that you could organize and do was the church. And we were talking about April and, and, and the recent observance of, of, of uh, Dr. King's uh, uh, tragic assassination. And you go back and people will say, well, why was everything at the church? Well, where else were you going to go? Right. Where could you organize? The church was everything. And so at least particularly for people of my parents' generation, the one place you could go and be respected and have a little dignity and not be called boy and not be mistreated was the church. Um, but my mother came from a big family. They were, you know, came out of Jim Crow. She and her twin brother were 12 and 13 of 16 kids, actually, but another set of twins mm -hmm. uh, passed away in childbirth. Uh, and of my mother's, you know, 13 other siblings, I'd say 10 of them stayed in Texas. Mm -hmm. A few escaped to California. Uh, during Jim Crow, the Mason-Dixon line sort of was a marginal point for where, frankly, blacks in the, sex, in the South uh, migrated. If That's they right. were west of the Mississippi, That's east right. of the Mississippi, the they tend That's to went right. to Chicago and Detroit to right. work in the factories. Mm -hmm. East of the Mississippi, people went to California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there were 10 people here. My mother was the only one that was privileged to go to college, but she had a brother, Sylvester Jones, who went in the Merchant Marines, found God, never went to college, didn't go to theology school, mm -hmm. uh, and decided he had the calling. And with nine brothers and sisters in Austin, it was sort of an instant congregation. Right. And so we started in a little church that they let us hold services there, I'd say up until the 1960s. But we, it was called the Church of the New Testament. Church of the New Testament. Uh, but we built our church by hand. You know, we, wow. you can imagine with three, literally three or 400 relatives, and we were all, George, this was sort of deliverance like creepy. I mean, we all, we, he walked in there and he was 400 people who all kind of looked the same. Yeah. But there were laborers and we did, right. we built this church by hand. It's a little cellar, cinder block church on, mm -hmm. on Harvey Street, just off Martin Luther King in Austin. And it's still there. But what I learned more than, I mean, it was a place, every, every Sunday was a family reunion in a weird way. But looking back, and I know other people have ridiculed the whole notion or concept of a village raising a child. We were protected right. and we were loved. Yes. And there were people that didn't have any of the education, didn't have any of the, the hope to even do some of the things that we hadn't begun to think about. But they were singularly united around protecting these babies and made sure that we were gonna have a chance to walk through every door that had ever been denied to them. And I tell people I, I, I drink and swear too much to, you know, they've ever thought about being a preacher, but there is one thing I know is that prayer works. And I believe in angels because there's just too much good that has happened to me in my life. And I know 
always knew whatever I was going through, that was this community of people. Okay, community who, who is a really big word were, here. Were, were praying for me. So I, I love this notion of community and church that you're talking about. In fact, the church you attend now has added, uh, historically added the word community. St. Luke, community, community United yeah. Methodist Church. And uh, it, it occurs to me that there are a lot of people in America today who would like a, a spiritual life which is more of an individual piety, their own personal search, uh, without that sense of community that the church represents. Uh, but creating an environment where people know your name and look after you and hold you accountable and, and, and believe in you and all those sorts of things is very much a part of what the role of religion is, isn't it? Well, we all want affirmation. And I know there is the struggle of have we, we lost that, but I think communities in different places. And it's harder for kids like you and I that grew up in a right. defined community. Yep. And, and it can be more dangerous. The, 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 the beauty, um, the liberation of social media, it lets people define their own communities. Mm -hmm. Now the bad news is you don't necessarily see who's on the other end of that. Mm -hmm. And so much of what is troubling our young people is living up to these unrealistic expectations of maybe what community is. But, but we, still, we still all want dignity. Yes. We all want somebody to know our names and I joke, you know, cheer, you know, I know Starbucks is going through their thing. Starbucks has become today's cheers for those it, of us old has. enough to remember That's the right. TV show. You walk in, somebody knows your name, exactly. they say, hey, That's they know right. what you want, they right. want how you're doing. We can argue that we don't, but we're all made fuller, richer yes. by believing there are people that look at our lives and say, you have something of worth. Um, and since we're talking about starting in the church, you know, it all at least starts with the notion that even though we may be conflicted about who has value, God wasn't. Yes. And even in our country's founding, right. you know, when you look at the Bill of Rights and everything, it's all, we all talked about inalienable rights that every individual has worth. And we know we didn't apply that in the same way, but as a church, as a community, as a country, what I still love about America, as tragic, as difficult as it's been, we have always had our eyes on that higher calling that all of us have these inalienable rights yes. and they ought not be limited based on who we are. Well, and one of the things that, that I learned early in struggling to sort of accept who was who was I heard, uh, I, I actually used to go to classes sometimes when I was mayor over at Dallas Theological mm -hmm. Seminary. Mm -hmm. They would do lunches, mm -hmm. businessmen lunches, and one speaker once uh, did a whole lunch ar around the notion that in order to hate somebody, which is really a strong word, mm -hmm. in order to hate somebody, then you have to accept the premise that God was wrong. Wow, there it is. Mm -hmm. And that's, once you think of it that's way, that's not a place that I think I want to go. Now you attend a, a congregation that is uh, African American, uh, predominantly, almost entirely, uh, and of course our congregation, Wilshire Baptist, is almost entirely Anglo. Yeah. And this is, I think, for many of us in our society, a, um, uh, you know, a, a sadness that we are still in a place that is as segregated voluntarily as, as is the case. And yet, uh, when, when white people uh, have a tendency to say, you know, why, why can't we be more integrated? We, we also seem to forget how important that black church experience is to uh, the, uh, the, the elevating of the dignity of, uh, of, of black people, the place where they can be fully themselves yeah. without having to be in traditionally white space, yeah. uh, so to speak. I, I, did, I think, I don't know that I've ever said anything more hurtful uh, to one of my good friends, Damon Thompson, who was my, I attended Austin College. Mm -hmm. A uh, wonderful place, still on the board of trustees. But by the time I graduated, George, I was the only black guy in my class. Wow. I was the first black guy in my fraternity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was, just, you know, I lived in a world where I yes. played with white kids, worked, studied, mm -hmm. right. and I was coming of age in a time where we're coming out of the civil rights movement, Dr. King's dead. I'm as much a disciple of Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X as I am King, and right. trying to find, but I'm living in this other world. And so I finish college, go to law school, and I move back here and I'm rooming with a couple of my fraternity brothers and they said well why don't you go to church with us and I said no 
I want to call them black that we had the same. And I was like, you know, there has to be one day where I can just express me. And so, I mean, too many, too much has been written and said about the notion that Sunday morning at 10 mm-hmm. o'clock is the most segregated right. hour in America. And I'm not saying this is right, but at least for your viewers, I will tell you, a lot of black people are comfortable with that. Right. We need that. Now, that puts a burden, maybe unfairly, and one of the reasons I respect you so, is there's no presumption that there is an enlightenment and love in these white churches. And one of the reasons you're so respected is you are progressive and thoughtful, and we do have a handful of folk at our church. But for a lot of us, it's like it's the only place we go. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to when my parents started the church, there was nowhere else you could go. And, And, you know, believe me, it was a struggle for my generation now, for our kids, You know, we literally went to church for breakfast and went to church for Sunday school. And then we stayed and went to service. And then maybe we went home for supper, And but usually we ate on the church. And then we had three o'clock service. And then we had prayer meeting. And we were all day at that? Oh, we were in all day. And my girls came to your church once and they loved it. I'd love to tell you they remember (laughs) your sermon, but they were like, Dad, we were out here an hour. An hour, I remember that. And I had to tell them, you know, and I I remember discussing this in one of the churches I went to, and the old folks were like, well, we don't think we're here long enough. Right. I tell people, this is where you got dignity. Right. And you have to think about it. Reason we didn't have all that, but you had usher board number one and usher board number two and all. Sure. But this Everybody was the one place. Everybody got to be somebody. That's exactly Everybody got right. to put on the and and they were like, Well, why are our songs so long? I was like, you you understand the common denominator in every church in America, in every big city in America in the mm-hmm. South, there is a fight over what's the oldest black church. Right. And they will, but the common number, they were all founded the Sunday after emancipation. Mm-hmm. When we were free, the good thing, the first thing we did was find places to worship. Yes. But people need to understand, we came from a generation of people that it was against the law mm-hmm. for us to be taught how to read, yes. how to write, to know how to sing. So when we had a church, if somebody could read, they became the choir master. Mm-hmm. And we repeat verses because nobody could read. Mm-hmm. So you'd get up and you'd sing a verse and we'd repeat it. Everything was memory by repetition and doing so. A lot of our service is built in that history, that struggle, that culture, that richness. And for so many of us, even today, that's a wonderful experience. We don't want to let that go. We have so many other opportunities right. to integrate and blend. And wait, trust me, I want to give your those watching this podcast, you know, we're not in there plotting and planning anything. We're just, we're recharging our batteries. Well, that's right. And, and of course, you know, the, the whole idea of moving from legalized segregation to desegregation means that we have the right to make choices right. of, of our own and for people to gather uh, in the ways that they wish is certainly their, their, their right and freedom, but, uh, but there are some sad legacies even of desegregation where say for example, uh, we, we, when Brown versus Board of Education uh, happened, uh, we had the forced integration now of schools and of course African American kids were moved and bust to white kids' schools. It wasn't the other way around. No. But the, 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 one of the biggest problems is it was the kids who were integrated, but all those role models of teachers and principals in, in the black schools uh, were, were not hired. They were, they were not moved into, into the integrated schools, and, and there was this loss of, uh, of role modeling and, and whatnot. So uh, I'd like to pick up after the break with you a little bit about this notion of where this goes. You mentioned Stokely Carmichael and and this notion of of economic power and uh, the future of the black community in in this way. I think it'd be really interesting, especially with your trade uh, history as well. So let's pick it up in just a moment. Good God salutes the vital services provided to our community by the North Texas Food Bank. Each day, the North Texas Food Bank Feeding Network provides access to more than 190,000 meals for hungry children, seniors, and families. Visit ntfb.org to get involved. We're back, Ron, talking about the future of uh, participation in the wider community of 
uh, black businesses and enterprises, including the black church, which has been an employer and uh, a driver of economic development in our communities. I have, I have a friend who's a pastor in South Dallas and, uh, you know, Freddie Haynes at, at Friendship West Baptist Church, and they're getting ready to have a $20 million expansion yeah. at, at their church. Transformational in that community, a tr tremendous impact. But you mentioned Stokely Carmichael as someone who said during this civil rights struggle that it's not just about getting the laws right. It's about empowering uh, black businesses and, 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 and seeing people in the black community have the opportunity to flourish because they have capital and they can build on their education and, and, and that sort of thing. So some of what happens in the black community with churches is this energy toward yeah. um, self-reliance and the opportunity to, to participate in that way. Uh, a lot of what you did as mayor was in trying to bridge uh, north and south, uh, the, the white and black communities, put the, the, the traditionally white business community in contact with South Dallas and black leaders. So that's been a, a hallmark of what you've tried to do as well. Yeah, it, it, it has. and and. Um and I would tell you, I, all of us, and not just me, I want to take this just beyond a black and white sure. um, 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 sort of conversation, because I know you've got a, 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 a wide range of people watching, um, but it's all just about that simple reality that going back to where we started in our first conversation, justice, mm -hmm. opportunity, right. give everybody an opportunity, and in my life, um, and why the black church is so important for all of us, it was that institution. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people that have similarly asked, why do we still have historically black colleges? Because there has to be somewhere where a little poor girl like mm -hmm. Willie Mae Jones or, mm -hmm. you know, Sophia Hernandez can come in and say, I don't have any money. And they go, you know what, we're going to make a way. That's right. We're going to find a way. Mm -hmm. uh, because the other thing I've learned is what our parents taught Southern Faith. Education is the key to everything. Mm -hmm. And if you separate out everything else we've talked about, what's still remarkably about our country, and you mentioned my work as trade rep, mm -hmm. I would um, go to places around the world in which that was this incredible adoration of America because of our election mm -hmm. of Barack Obama, but also a frustration because Africa, the world thought, well, Barack Obama here is going to be, everything's going to be fine. Yes. And then people would equally criticize me. Well, your policy towards so-and-so looks the same difference as it does here. Mm -hmm. But I would always challenge them and say, well, if we're no better than that, then no better than China. Mm -hmm. When you had your revolution and you had a chance to send your kids, mm -hmm. why'd you, where, did you send them to the United States? Yeah. Or did you send them to China? Right. Did right. you send them somewhere? Yeah. So we still have this beacon. But within that, so I have to process all that as mayor. Sure. And we were talking about schools. I'm going to try to unpack a lot quickly. And I think it's okay for us not to run from the fact that when the Supreme Court did say, you've got to stop with separate but equal, and then they had to come back 10 years later, people yes. forget and say, we mean it now. Mm -hmm. um, you saw this mass exodus of yes. urban America, That's right. of white families and right. businesses to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And one of the points I try to make to people about the challenges of urban education, the least mobile institution in America is the public schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. Businesses don't like the neighborhoods in their move. Churches move. Right. Not knocking on him, but you know, one of our buddies, and I played golf with him, Jack Graham's church ain't anywhere close to where it is. It's up right. in Plano. Schools leave. Right. So how dare we say to teachers, oh, you aren't doing the job you were doing. You've taken all the middle class families, you've moved the jobs in the tax base, mm -hmm. and you've left us with a decidedly um, um, impoverished first generation of kids with, from single parents and said, you're going to hold them to the same standards as my kids and your kids and Stuart Keller mm -hmm. who come to school every day fed and hungry. Mm -hmm. That's BS. Right. And we ought to accept that. Now, what I can tell people, what I do know based on my own story, the fact that these kids are impoverished or that they may not speak English has nothing to do with their ability to transform our world. Because when I was 13 years old, I mentioned my mother's twin brother. My mother was the teacher, the passionate leader, never had a drink in her life, never smoked a cigarette, and my dad drank, unfortunately. 
that was the cause of his death. Her twin brother was a bartender. But in those days, if your, your, your uncle was the head waiter, everybody had a job. <laughs> so 12, 13 years old, I'm a bus boy, I'm right. setting tables, I'm working, I'm doing the, the finest country clubs, the Sheridan Crest. And more than anything, what just sort of struck me is the people that waited on me never asked my name, never said, hey kid, what do you want? All they saw was a bus boy. Right. And what I caution people is if in one generation I can go from Jim Crow and being a bus boy to a graduate of Boston College and the University of Texas and the mayor of Dallas, secretary of state in the state that the wouldn't state let my parents vote, That's right. do not make the mistake mm -hmm. of thinking that now these young Hispanic or Vietnamese kids who are waiting on us at the country clubs and more in my yard. If you look at them and only see mm -hmm. a bus boy right. or a yard man, we're missing the we're boat. We're and then our trip. challenge, what we know is how do we give them the opportunities? And, and two of the things I worked on as mayor that I was most proud of was one initiated by my friend Bob Thornton, uh, who I'd worked with on the zoo board with our right. friend Stuart Keller, and he came up with an idea called the Rising Star Scholars Program. And the idea was that the smart kids are gonna get scholarships. Mm -hmm. The kids at the bottom get help. But we came up with a program that any kid that graduates from, from any public school in Dallas, mm -hmm. and it ain't just DISD, we've got Richardson, Will Humphrey, where the C average can go to community college for free. Nice. And George, the difference in your opportunities Mm -hmm. of even two years of community college are incredible. Yes. And the other thing, um, and, I, and thank God that, that, that Senator West and Helen Giddings picked up the ball, but I was sitting at a con mayor's conference in Chicago. And whenever I would travel, the one thing I'd do was leave security, leave them, just walk around downtown by myself. Mm -hmm. And what, what struck me and hurt me about the difference between Dallas and Chicago and Atlanta in 1995, when I was elected mayor of Dallas, Dallas was the largest city in North America without a state-supported four-year university in the city limits. Mm -hmm. And again, if you look at the difference in Dallas and Houston, right. it's the presence of Texas Southern and the University mm -hmm. of Houston. Right. So that started us on the journey right. of creating the University of North Texas, because again, you've got to have some place, all these first-generation kids yes. who probably have to work to pay for school can go to college. And that's open to everybody, whether they're black, they're white or brown. And if you're in a room and everybody has a high school degree, a college degree, man, that's a certain set of common language of community right. that makes problem solving so much easier mm -hmm. than when you have a community of people that have lacked education and opportunity and these extremely wealthy business people on the other side. And for too long, that's what defined, defined our city. So that investment in education and opportunity is, is what's gonna be key. And you see that around the world. People around the world, in spite of our flaws, will sacrifice everything they can to send their kids to America because they believe they're gonna get the best education. Well, uh, you mentioned the world, and I'm holding in my hand a uh, ball marker <laughs> that I received from my friend Ron Kirk that says 16th Ambassador Ron Kirk, uh, Office of the President of the United States, yeah. uh, the Executive Office. You were uh, the 16th Trade Representative of, of the United States, and uh, you know when we talk about the global community, uh, the world is smaller now, and all of what you're saying, we've been talking mostly about Dallas and about Texas and about the United States and about uh, opportunity, whether education or economic opportunity. You know the word economic comes from a, a, a Greek word, combination of words which actually means the, the laws or the rules of the household. That is, uh, how, how, do, how do we organize the household in order that everyone has a place at the table, everyone has a, something to do, everyone is welcome in the house. And, and this, this notion of global trade plays right into that uh, in, in this global environment. So when, when we talk about trade imbalances and these days trade tariffs and trade wars and that sort of thing, give us some idea of your perspective on how all of this works in order to create a more equitable and fair uh, global economy. I'm gonna do it and I know I'm gonna try to do it because that's a lot to unpack. It is a lot. Um, and I, am, I was so privileged the president uh, invited me to be a part of his cabinet and to be mm -hmm. part of the forward-looking face 
uh, of this country. And I'm often asked what I've learned, and I'll, and I'll start at the top, uh, my top line that I always share with Americans is, whatever you perceive our problems, we live so much richer lives in this country right. than the rest. I mean, you don't know poverty. Right. You wanna know poverty, you go to Ethiopia, you go to Mumbai. And so we, we have what the rest of the world looks at us and sits back and laughs. Y'all got first world problems. Right. You know, your kids, your kids think they're impoverished if they got, they've still got a 3G phone. Yes. And your kid exactly. just right. got 4G. Yep. You, 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 these kids are saying, can we get clean drinking water? Right. You know, can we get somewhere to get to school? So one, never lose sight of how blessed we are here. Two, over the last 40 years, and I know there have been wars and skirmishes now because of this age of, of technology, we aren't dealing with state actors, but people who want to sow discord, but there has been a broader war around the world over the last 50 years. And I'm not so much saying America's one, but we are talking about justice, but the principles of freedom yeah. have won out. That's what brought down the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. That's what tore down apartheid. Mm -hmm. That that notion of freedom, self-determination has won mm -hmm. and is existing in different forms in here. Mm -hmm. But people around the world have said, I want, I want to live in a society where I get to pick my own leaders, mm -hmm. I get to chart my own course, mm -hmm. and I'd like to go see if I can make a little money based on my own skill set. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge from that, as one economist said, is we now got four billion competitors that we didn't have. That's right. And, you know, you and I grew up at a time when your parents put their hard-earned dollars to work, and if they made liver, you turned up your nose. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, George, eat your liver, you know, right. some kid. And There's you some kid the kid, in Biafra. That, and, you know, uh, and, uh, and I exactly. tell them, you know yeah. what, they still may be starving, yeah. but, man, they're reading yes. and they're studying right. because they want to live like us. Right. We shouldn't be afraid of that as yes. Americans. And I'm, I hate that we have so demonize the word trade because it's now come become a proxy for what we started on what's my community yes and americans have now been told oh don't do trade because basically they're responsible for your job being gone it's not yes. your fault right. that the factory owner didn't modernize right. or that he put in stuff we'll just blame it on them mexico mm -hmm. proxy nafta or this proxy china when what america should be looking at is that as blessed and as rich as we are, mm -hmm. and we are still the most dynamic, dynamic economy in the world by a magnificent factor. Mm -hmm. We're only 5% of the world's population. Right. So if you want to preach the gospel and you want to transform lives, you want to run a business, do you want to play to the 5% or the 90%? Right. So one, this doesn't have to be a one-way street. And then secondly, when people have the opportunity to just say one simple thing, I want my kids to have it better than me. They tend to operate differently than if you live in a world full of impoverished, uneducated kids with no hope. And if you want to know what create what the Petri dish is for people that would put bombs in their kids' backpacks and send them to blow themselves up, it's no hope. No hope. No there opportunity. And trade is the tool, mm -hmm. one of the economic tools we use to say there is hope. It can be in commerce. Right. Commerce can create opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people who say, oh, that's a bit cyn cynical. But no two countries that have ever entered an economic partnership have gone to war with one another. Wow. Ever. There you go. And so it's complex, but we shouldn't fear it. We should use it as another tool to help sow peace, but also to grow our economy and create opportunities for our kids. Well, Ron, whether it's uh, religion or commerce or politics, uh, all of these are arenas in which we are trying to bring people together. And thank you for the way you've always done that and continue to do it. I'm grateful for your, uh, for your work and for your witness. Well, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to steal your show a little bit. And I want to thank you because you are a great leader for our city. And since I started with Dr. King, um, and, and I always remind people, he did say something other than I have a dream. That's right. And I love the fact that people now encourage folks. But if, if your listeners, you want to read something, go back and read Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Oh my. It's one of the most powerful letters he yes. wrote. He wrote it all from memory on stationery because it was written to the church. Yes. And his challenge to the church is how can you be a voice for the status quo? 
right. in a time right now, we need the church to be a leader. Thank you. To be the leading edge voice. And at least in Dallas, you are one of those leaders. I appreciate you for it. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, buddy. Okay. Good God salutes the vital services provided to our community by the North Texas Food Bank. Each day, the North Texas Food Bank Feeding Network provides access to more than 190,000 meals for hungry children, seniors, and families. Visit ntfb.org to get involved.